Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining this week's seminar from the Liberal Earth Collaborative and Washington University's Evolution, Ecology and Population Biology Group and co-sponsored by the Center of Study of Race, Ethnicity and Equity. Today, I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Rasen Bainariv. He is a wildlife veterinarian interested in the ecological approaches of health and particularly the One Health concept and the field of conservation medicine. He is a co-founder of the Mahalyana Lab, which is a research and training center in Madagascar. And he is also associated to the San Luis Zoo here in Missouri. Uh, Dr. Rasan Bainariv earned his veterinary degree from the Department of Veterinary Medicine and Sciences of the University of Antananarivo in Madagascar. He obtained his master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Montreal in Canada and earned his PhD degree in biology from the University of Missouri St. Louis. Dr. Rasan Manarif has an impressive profile of publications in prestigious journals such as Biodiversity and Conservation and Nature. His research interests uh, focus on the potential impacts of humans and domestic animals on wildlife health in various ecosystems in Madagascar looking at, for example, the transmission of pathogens between humans, domestic animals, and endemic lemurs, carnivores, and rodents. Before I hand in over Dr. Rasan Manarif, I want to remind all the audience to leave questions and comments in the YouTube chat section, and we will read them at the end of the seminar. And stay tuned for the next week's seminar by Catherine Werner, who is the sustainable director of the city of San Luis. It's gonna be really interesting. Without further delay, let me introduce to you, Dr. Fidisu Rasan Bainariv and his presentation entitled, Health and Diseases at the Human Wildlife Interface in Madagascar. Take it away, Dr. Rasan Bainariv. Thank you very much. Um, let me try this. All right, I think I'm sharing my screen. So uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for having me this, this evening, this afternoon. Um, I'm really excited to be here and I really wish I could be in, uh, in St. Louis, uh, a city that, that I hold close and dear to my, to my heart as this is where I've uh, spent many years doing my, doing my PhD. So um, today I, I would like to talk to you about this presentation um, about health and disease at the, at the human and domestic animals and wildlife interface uh, here in Madagascar. Um, so as, as mentioned uh, in the nice presentation, my, my work is mostly oriented towards the study of, uh, of disease and health at the, the multiple and the multiple interaction between human health animal health and environmental health, especially with an emphasis on uh, wildlife conservation. And um, I think everybody realize, realized or knows now that the current COVID crisis is a powerful reminder of this interconnectedness and the and this recent spillovers and spillbacks into domestic and wild animals. Uh, of, of the pandemic, of the disease, in that the fact that we may also need to, to address the disease in animals, uh, if we are to, to eradicate it. We'll come back a little to COVID a little later in the, in the talk. But uh, my presentation today will be a little different uh, than, than a typical research seminar, as I will briefly present a few different projects that uh, that will touch on one or more of the constituents of the One Health Triad. And with this, I will hopefully highlight the, the multiple interaction between these parts and um, highlight the need to take them all into to consideration. Um, and if there's one more takeaway message that I would like to convey today as well is that health research matters for biodiversity conservation, uh, in particular here in Madagascar where I work. 
And then I would fur further argue that strengthening strengthening locally led science is particularly important for wildlife conservation and the prevention of, uh, of the spread of disease at this human domestic animal and wildlife interface. Um, so oftentimes when, when we think about disease and wildlife conservation, we, we think about a few high profile wildlife disease that, that have gathered a lot of attention and rightfully so, because they have caused ma major declines in wildlife population. For example, you have chytridiomycosis in, uh, in amphibians that have presumably caused the, the extinction of uh, the local or global extinction of more than 90 species of, uh, of frogs. Or the white nose syndromes in bat. Uh, this fungal disease that is sweeping through the North American uh, continent and that has decimated many colonies of bats. But, or again, uh, metapneumovirus, the, this respiratory disease syndromes in, in gorillas and great apes um, in, in Africa that, that has been um, associated that associated with uh, human disease as well. But health issues in wildlife populations are, are not always so, so dramatic and may not manifest themselves as, as huge die-offs. Um, many might be a little more insidious or uh, causing gradual decline of fitness in populations. And this requires close monitoring of the health status of the animals and compare them with uh, the normal. The problem is that for many or most of these wild animal, wild animal species, uh, we do not have a normal range of, of values to compare a sample to and detect any unbalance, at least here for the, the wild animals of, of Madagascar. And this is why Dr. Randy Jungi uh, from the Columbus Zoo started the, the Prosimian Biomedical Survey Project for, for the lemurs. And uh, we are just starting for, for the Euplaridae um, as well. The Euplaridae is that endemic carnivore, speech, uh, carnivore family of, of Madagascar that, in, that includes the, the FUSA. And so basically the, the goal of these projects are to but to provide a baseline of biomedical values of wild animals, which will allow us to study the effects of uh, anthropogenic changes on, on the, the health of, of animals, for example. For example, or we could study the effects of natural events like cyclones or fires uh, or drop on, on the, the health of uh, of animals. Um, this will give us an opportunity to, uh, to compare, to study and compare uh, the, the health of, uh, of animals in captivity and in the wild. And uh, also, uh, and then like take bit better care of, uh, of animals that are under our care. Um, these, Biomedical survey projects are, are, are now also becoming a, an essential tool for, for translocation and reintroduction that are hopefully becoming more common. Um, and, um, and so it's, are becoming a, a, an essential tool for, for conservation. Um, biomedical survey projects are also needed to, to monitor the, the spread of, uh, of disease in, in those uh, wild animal populations. And one of those diseases that, um, that, we're, that we're concerned about and that, that we're interested, uh, that we're just starting to, to, to monitor in uh, in, in the lemurs of, of Madagascar is lemur malaria. Um, just like in humans, uh, malaria in lemurs is caused by a protozoan parasite 
from the genus uh, Plasmodium. And um, it is transmitted by, by mosquitoes. Um, Plasmodium in other species like in birds or in great apes uh, has had negative health effects. Um, we uh, can think of, for example, of the, the extinction, of the local extinction of, of several species of birds in, uh, in Hawaii. Um, um, and and some um, chimpanzees that got that have gotten sick of uh, uh, by limer, by by plasmodium uh, parasites. So uh, we're now just starting to uh, to monitor the um, the prevalence and the, the spread of uh, of lemur malaria in in, in lemurs. Um, in, in Madagascar, and we we're starting we're starting to do this using banked samples that that were collected since 2015 uh, at five different sites uh, on five different uh, lemur species, including one site uh, that are uh, where animals were were in captivity, and so. Um, so we used uh, PCR techniques to 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 find out where whether animals were uh, were infected or not. It is um, important to know that lemur malaria is not something that is new, and it has been known since the 1950s or something like that that the lemur were infected with uh, with malaria. But most of the studies that were done. We're mostly looking at um, the evolution of lemur malaria in relation to uh, of plasmodium in relation to um, to human malaria as well, uh, human malaria. So not not really looking at the effects and the prevalence of the of the parasites in in humans uh, in lemurs. Sorry. Um, so what we what we found is that um, there's a high prevalence of uh, of malaria in in lemurs at all those uh, all those different sites. Um, we only had adults, so we we could not uh, compare between the different age groups. But what we see is that there, there are differences between the different sites as uh, the the different sites. So sites that are in uh, rainforest, uh, like in Betopna, uh, on the east coast, or Mangevu further south, were more likely to be uh, to be infected than animals that were in, in drier areas. We also see uh, in, in one site uh, where we have precise location of where the animals were we're located, we we see uh, variation within the within the the site as well, where animals that were closely closer to to the edge of the of the forest were more likely to be to be affected. But this warrants further research, and whether this um, this pattern is. Um, uh, exist in other sites as well uh, will need to be to be looked at. Um, this has implication um, for the risk of, of transmission and also potentially um, the, the risk for zoonotic transmission as well as lemurs that are closer to the site uh, to, to the edge of the forest are um, can potentially interact with uh, with humans. Um, through the, the mosquito, through shared mosquitoes. In fact, the, the liver plasmodium that uh, that were found in in, um, in our samples and in other samples are closely related to plasmodium ovale. Uh, that that is one of the five um, plasmodium species that that infects um, that infects humans. Um, and 
the implication of a potential zoonotic uh, transmission of, of malaria between, uh, between lemurs and humans is that uh, what we see in other parts of the world where uh, there is zoonotic transmission, where there's transmission of malaria between humans and, um, and animals that are, that are living close together is that um, this complicates any effort to, to eliminate, eliminate uh, malaria um, locally um, because it persists into the, the animal reservoirs. We also do not know uh, whether this plasmodium species are impacting the are impacting the, the lemur health as well and the, and this is something that we're going to to look at um, in the in the future um, there were there are other other parasites that uh, other pathogens that have that have made the jump and that are being transmitted between humans and lemurs. For example, you have uh, some bacteria that are causing diarrhea or um, other protozoan parasites and viruses uh, that are causing, um, that are causing uh, diarrhea in, in humans and that, are, that have been found in, in lemurs. Uh, interestingly, only the lemurs that are living in degraded habitat uh, of uh, of the protected areas where um, were infected by these these different pathogens, and this highly suggests that um, the lemurs were uh, infected by by the humans with whom they they interact. It's the same for for carnivores as well, where you have domestic. Uh, domestic carnivores such as your dogs and cats and that are infecting wild carnivores. Uh, for example, Tuxoplasma gondii, which is a parasite that is only transmitted by, uh, by cats, uh, which are not native to Madagascar. And we found a uh, high seroprevalence, so high exposure of, uh, of FUSA to, to Tuxoplasma gondii. Um, canine parvovirus, similar uh, a parasite, uh, a virus that is transmitted to to the from the dogs and some species of endemic carnivores uh, were infected by by it as well. Um, and finally, Leptospira, which is a uh, zoonotic pathogens, and which was found in a large proportion of the, of the endemic carnivores. For all of these, we do not know whether the pathogen, uh, either Tuxo, uh, Canon parvovirus or Leptospira are causing any disease per se in the, uh, in the, the endemic carnivores, but it is important to, to note and, uh, and to monitor. And this is why we're also trying to study the, the transmission and the spread of, of, uh, of pathogens, of, of microbes. Um, and for this, we, we use the DNA fingerprinting and network analysis, where we're trying to study the extent of uh, microbial exchange among carnivores in a, in a product area. So for this, we looked at, for example, we looked at um, specific, specifically at uh, E. coli, which is a, uh, a bacteria that, uh, that is non-pathogenic for the most part. And using DNA fingerprinting techniques, we could um, link two individuals to one another if those two individuals had the same DNA finger, uh, if had, E. coli with the same DNA fingerprinting techniques. So among uh, about 40 carnivores in a, in a protected area of, uh, of Madagascar, we linked, um, we collected fecal samples and uh, used those uh, DNA fingerprinting techniques and obtained the, 
the following network, uh, where each of those nodes are a, a, a species of carnivore, whether it's a dog, a cat, or an endemic uh, carnivore. And, uh, and here they're linked together, linked to each other, if they have at least one um, common E. coli um, genotype with them. So what we see is a, a very dense uh, network where a lot of the, the carnivores are um, sharing this, uh, sharing um, E. coli, are sharing a, a bacteria that suggests that they, they, they are interacting with each other and they they can potentially pass the bacteria uh, they have passed the bacteria from one another or have op uh, obtained it from, from a common source. <laughs> uh, using this network, we, we, we then simulated the, the introduction of a pathogen. So if, uh, if a bacteria gets into the network, how, would it, how will it spread uh, within the different animals? And, what we can see from this is that after a very short time, um, all of the animals that are that are in, that are in the network uh, or will become will become infected. Um, and then, when we repeat this exercise multiple times. Uh, within a SIR framework, uh, we could obtain the same um, this dynamic of of infection between um, between animals. And uh, here again, we see that after a very short period of time, a lot of the the animals will become infected, and the out outbreak will basically be be over with uh, all of the animals being infected. Um, and this network and these techniques can inform us as to the dynamic and how a pathogen, uh, if it were to be introduced within this, uh, this community were to, to spread, but also um, it, it can also inform us about the potential for sharing antimicrobial resistant germs and genes, um, uh, which, uh, which is becoming an increasing problem in, uh, in both humans, domestic animals, and, and wildlife as well. Uh, for example, earlier this year, uh, some, uh, some researcher found ringtail lemurs that were infected with uh, drug resistant tuberculosis, or uh, other researchers found uh, high uh, prevalence of uh, antimicrobial resistance genes in, in, the, in the feces of, of lemurs, um, which suggests, which indicate that, uh, that lemurs are um, in, um, exposed to, to antimicrobial resistant uh, germs and uh, if needed, those, uh, those drugs would not work on them. Then we, we can use the, the same social network, uh, the same social network analysis to potentially guide uh, pathogen control in this population. And so what, what we wanted to see is whether we could potentially target individuals within this network to, um, to reduce the spread, to reduce the speed of uh, the spread of, of the disease. So uh, on your left, you have a graph that shows the, the spread of the pathogen within uh, the original network. You have a very high speed of, uh, of transmission and the outbreak uh, is is over very soon. Uh, on the right, you have the same network in which we removed randomly um, 10, 10 different nodes. Um, and 
we um, and we again simulated the, the spread of the pathogen within the within this network. And now finally in this uh, in the, the network and uh, the right, there are some uh, some animals that that were uh, specifically targeted using an algorithm um, developed by Borghetti and um, where we can uh, where animals that play uh, a significant role into the network that are more connected uh, than others or that will disrupt the connectedness of the network can be can be selected uh, and and removed. And here we see how how this will affect the spread of the, the disease in the in the network. Um, that that is effectively flattened the curve as we said in 2020. Um, we have the disease that where less animals on, on average get infected at the same time and uh, an outbreak that lasts a little, a little longer. So what we've seen is that um, selectively removing individuals is, is slowing, uh, slowing transmission of the, of the disease in, in, this, uh, in this network. And then this also highlights the need to, um, to monitor disease in domestic animals um, because ultimately they will, uh, because of density, uh, they will allow the persistence and allow the introduction of, uh, of disease into this network of uh, uh, this community of, of carnivores. And so these are projects that, that are mainly led by uh, two of my, of my students. Um, Valsu is looking at canine power virus in dogs that are living both in, in cities of, uh, in the, the main city of Tana and also in, in villages that are neighboring um, protected areas. And what, uh, what Falso is using uh, PCR techniques as well. And what, what is seen is that about 2% of the animals that are apparently uh, healthy in, um, in villages near protected areas of Madagascar are harboring canine power virus. Again, canine power virus is this uh, virus that um, that causes diarrhea, um, vomit, and uh, gastroenteric gastro uh, hemorrhagic gastroenteritis in in dogs, and can be transmitted uh, to to some of the some of the carnivores. Um, another project that is looking at uh, disease in uh, in domestic animals is led by um, by Santacha, who is looking at uh, avian mycoplasmosis, uh, which is a, a bacterial disease that is um, uh, that is infecting mainly the, the the chickens and the turkeys of. Uh, um, the domestic chickens and, and turkeys causing respiratory issues or um, uh, conjunctivitis, uh, respiratory issues and conjunctivitis in, in chickens. And when, when it gets transmitted to uh, wild birds, it can, uh, it can cause um, disease and death as well. So what Santa Fe is doing is looking at um, Avian mycoplasmosis in in chickens that are uh, both in uh, through the, the the trade network in uh, so on, on market stalls. So to identify risk factors and the the potential for the spread of disease uh, through the movement of birds 
as well as the, uh, the movement of, uh, of equipment uh, back and forth between, between farms as well. And, um, and as we were trying to, this goal was to, to look at um, the, the spread of avian macroplasmosis at this interface between domestic animals, domestic birds and wildlife as well. But just as we were gearing up to, um, to sample wild, wild birds uh, in, in protected areas, then, uh, then COVID um, has occurred. And so I think just as any, anybody in this room, um, COVID has put a, a high on, on many of, of our projects. Uh, I know personally, I was um, stuck in the, in the US for, uh, for a large part of 2020 and trying to, to follow the, the, the situation of COVID-19 here in, uh, in Madagascar in the meantime. Um, but uh, I grew frustrated, I would say, because uh, COVID-19 was, um, was spreading and we did not have any information through the government. And so using some of the um, techniques and skills that that we had, um, we built this this dashboard that will allow to to document the dynamics of the epidemic in Madagascar, and also to to study the, the spread uh, of uh, to predict the spread of the the disease using uh, using uh, mobile phone data or uh, transit. Um, transit mobility data. And so and this allowed us to, to stay a little bit um, active in, 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 the, in the research um, while landing ahead in the, in the control of, uh, of COVID-19 in, in Madagascar. Uh, more recently, we're, um, we started to, to do um, some modeling as well to, to, to help prioritize the vaccina vaccination efforts and those allocation of, uh, of the vaccines that are in limited, extremely limited quantity here in Madagascar and trying to, to help the, the government or um, to propose uh, strategies to the government to um, to optimize the, the vaccination efforts in, in Madagascar. But um, my main passion is for, for wildlife medicine, uh, wildlife medicine and conservation. And the, the risk of, uh, of COVID-19 on an animal population um, is, is a big question. Uh, and that there are many indications that lemur species might be susceptible to the, to the disease as well. Uh, just this week, earlier this week, there, there was this paper that came out that predicted the, the zoonotic capacity of, of mammals to, to transmit SARS-CoV-2 and indicates that many primate species uh, will be might be able to not only be infected but also transmit the uh, the disease as well, which will um, which will therefore be very important uh, very important information for if we are to uh, to er eradicate the disease um, and and this is particularly important. To, to monitor the disease and assess the risk of a spillover between humans, domestic animals, and wildlife. Um, as you can see on, on the photos uh, in the lower right here, you have uh, people that are in very close contact with, uh, with lemurs uh, and can potentially transmit the, the disease or uh, 
contract the disease from, from lemurs. So in order to increase our um, sample size and to better monitor, um, better monitor disease spread in, in humans and in animals, in animals mainly, we were starting this uh, animal health platform. Um, which is a, a syndromic surveillance of, uh, of animal disease, a syndromic system, a syndromic surveillance system of, of animal disease. And basically, this is a collaboration between the veterinarians and researchers that will allow us to collect, store, and analyze data on, on disease occurrences. Um, and will allow us to collect samples from a wide range of, of, of species as well, uh, both domestic and uh, and wild in many different areas of uh, of Madagascar. Um, our goal is that this will allow us to document the trends of of animal disease and syndromes in Madagascar through times. Um, and potentially detect emerging threats uh, to domestic animal and uh, also biodiversity. Um, and if done correctly, then facilitate res rapid response by, by authorities in case there's any emerging threat to, to animal health. Um, and then another uh, advantage of, of this uh, syndromic surveillance system is that uh, we are able to collect a large number of samples that can be used by Malagasy students and researchers to conduct or expand uh, their research. For example, Santaja, uh, like about her, about who I talked about earlier, and he's studying having uh, mycoplasma in, in birds. He was also able to use samples that were collected by Association Varta and Steve Goodman uh, on wild birds in the cities that uh, where he conducted his, his, uh, his studies so that he could look at uh, the infection and the potential risk of, uh, of infection of wild birds while then produced birds in, in those cities as well. Or Ruzu was using samples that were collected by the Mad Dog Initiative to, um, to study tick-borne infections in both domestic dogs and domestic cats, um, looking at the risk of uh, transmission of disease between domestic dogs and, um, and wild carnivores as well. I and and this uh, th this last part about the, the samples uh, sharing the samples and using samples that were collected and and that would otherwise be be thrown away uh, is very close to my heart because I strongly believe that um, the only realistic path to to conserve Madagascar's biodiversity is if, if uh, the conservation research and management uh, consists of well-trained Malagasy. And so to achieve this, we, we started uh, Marlina Labs, which is uh, a training and research center uh, located in, in Tana, the, the capital. And, and our goal was to provide the space, the tools and the mentorship uh, for young Malagasy students and scientists to, to explore their, their own questions and, um, and also to, to, um, to, provide, to provide training and uh, demystify molecular biology techniques. So oftentimes Malagasy students read about those techniques and um, those methods in, in papers but do not have the chance or the opportunities to, to use them uh, themselves. And so we're conducting multiple trainings that have allowed um, 
to introduce uh, molecular biology techniques to workshop to more than 50 students. And uh, um, some of those students receive daily mentoring uh, and, uh, and are working on, on thesis uh, with regards to health and disease in, in lemurs, in carnivores, in chickens, and the, the multiple interaction between humans, domestic animals, and, and wildlife. Um, Santaja, as well as other of these, uh, these students are now authors or co-authors in, in uh, several different publications or, or manuscripts that are, that are in preparation. And so um, with that, um, I think, I hope that I could demonstrate or that I showed how uh, human health is closely connected to animal health and environmental health and the over, um, and also that, um, the local science is is needed for um, to promote to promote science and and conserve uh, the the biodiversity. And um, I'd like to thank you for your for your attention. Um, would also like to to thank uh, many people, uh, my mentors, Dr. Randy Youngie, but. Patty Parker, Jess Metcalf, and Ingrid Fulton, as well as uh, institutions that are um, that are supporting the work that we're doing here, starting with uh, the St. Louis Zoo, uh, Madagascar Fauna and Flora Group, and uh, um, and the Harris World Ecology Center that have supported my work for my PhD. I'd like also to thank the, the many students who are working with us. Uh, on some of these uh, of these projects and uh, helping moving these projects forward. Thank you. Thank you. Really, really interesting, and I feel really bad for the lemur species. <laughs> so, is there any hope? Like, how do you? see those uh, lemur populations like in the next 10, 20 or 30 years? Is there any hope for the lemurs? Uh, and that's a difficult question. Um, is there any hope for the lemurs? Uh, I think in the, right now the, the, the lemur populations are all decreasing, um, mainly because of habitat, habitat change. And I think that um, to, to answer your, your question uh, simply, yes, I think that there, there is hope for the, for the lemurs, but it will require a lot of work and a lot of change in minds as to how to uh, best con conserve them. Um, if trends continue exactly the way they are, uh, there's very little hope, but I would not be in here if there were no, no hope, I think. So I'm hoping that there's hope. Well, thank you. Really, really fascinating talk and fantastic work that you're doing in Madagascar. A question that occurred to me during your talk, I, um, I, I feel like at this point in the pandemic, we know a fair amount on how to mitigate the spread of COVID in human populations. Do you have any thoughts on um, what the mitigation strategies should be to prevent the spread of COVID from human populations to lemur populations or other wildlife populations in Madagascar? Are we thinking about the same methods as preventing transmission among humans or are other uh, preventative measures needed? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that, um, well, to to limit the, the risk of transmission to to animals, we we need to to limit the transmission of of COVID nineteen within humans first, and and the and the techniques that 
that we have and the methods that we have and that we should use uh, are there. So um, vaccination, um, limiting interactions and um, the non-pharmaceutical in interventions as well. So trying to limit the, the spread of the disease between ourselves is one of the major step that will allow us to, to limit the, the, the potential, well, to limit the risk of transmission to, to wildlife, including lemurs as well. Thank you, really difficult question indeed. Uh, here we have a question from Krista Milic. Uh, she says, thanks for the great talk, Fidi. Are you able to monitor the wild populations for COVID at this point, or is the logistics of preserving the samples too complicated at these remote field sites? She refers to white lemur populations. So we are, um, we, we started a little earlier this year to, to start doing, uh, doing captures of, of lemurs as well, uh, again, to, to, uh, to study the, the health of, of lemurs through the prosumer biological survey project. And one step that we've had it in our protocol. So first we're, we're taking all, all necessary measures to limit the transmission. So using uh, personal protective uh, equipment, having all staff vaccinated. And then one additional step that we're, that we're doing now in, in lemurs that that are anesthetized is that uh, we are collecting blood uh, and doing um, rapid diagnostic tests, tests just, just in case. We, we do not know whether those tests work on, on lemurs, but in case uh, there is a positive, we may be able to tell whether some lemurs are exposed to to uh, COVID-19 or not. And then we're also uh, collecting samples that will allow us further down the line to, to test for, um, for COVID-19 infection in those, in those animals. So we're collecting the samples. Um, there's no clear pathway yet as to whether we're going to be able to, to test them. Um, I know that a little earlier uh, during the pandemic, some animals died in, in captivity um, and they were suspected to, to, to die from COVID, but it turns out that they did not die from, from COVID uh, as they were tested and came, came back negative. So I hope this answers the question. Yes, thank you. I, I wonder if um, you know of any plans potentially in the future to um, administer vaccination campaigns among the lemur population for COVID-19 or among um, any of the other animal populations that are afflicted by viruses in Madagascar, such as the um, carnivores and parvovirus. Um, so there are no plans yet for for lemur being vaccinated to, uh, against COVID. I know that some animals in, in zoos in captivity in, uh, in the US or, or in Europe were vaccinated against, um, against COVID, but mainly great apes, I think. Um, any, any vaccination to, uh, of lemurs and, and other wildlife will require a lot of a lot of testing and and I think that that still uh, is not a priority right now and so so this is not going to to happen any, anytime soon um, with regards to canine power virus and, and carnivores uh, the there's also no vaccines for, for the Euploridae that is approved for, for the vaccination. And any vaccination campaign is also logistically difficult. So 
there's um, no, I, I do not think that there's any plan that this is something that is thought about, um, that is discussed sometimes as to whether it is possible uh, to vaccinate them. For example, uh, wildlife are vaccinated against rabies, but not against uh, canine power virus. Thank you. Um, something uh, like a general question. Do you have evidence or do you know about evidence or insights about how global change is affecting the wildlife diseases in Madagascar? So global uh, global climate change is probably, as far as I know, I do not have, um, there's no research yet on to, uh, the effect of global climate change onto disease, disease transmission. But a little bit like elsewhere, global climate change uh, is probably going to affect, for example, the, the density and the, um, the density of mosquitoes or uh, other factors. And, and this will affect whether increase or decrease and uh, the risk of transmission of, of malaria, for example. Um, so the things that we're going to see in, in humans, whether it increases or decreases, is likely to occur as well in, in the wildlife populations as well. We have another question here from the YouTube audience, which is, what is the population of feral dogs like in Madagascar? Is it large? And are pet dogs, cats, et cetera, that are near wild areas vaccinated routinely? Uh, so yes, there is a large population of dogs, uh, a little less of cats. Uh, it is not estimated yet as to how many dogs are there um, in, in Madagascar uh, as a country. Um, or that are living near protected areas. And to, um, but th this is a study that needs to be done. Somebody volunteers. Um, and then to answer the second question is, I uh, know like, most of the dogs and cats that are living in near protected areas do not receive any veterinary care uh, routinely. If the vaccination, um, deworming or or even just just food and um yeah and and this is an issue that um that maybe needs to be addressed is to, in order to limit the transmission of disease between dogs that are living in um in near protected areas and that are encroaching and interacting with um, wildlife. Maybe there needs to be some discussion as to whether there needs to be a mandatory vaccination or um, veterinary care for those animals. Thank you. Um, another kind of general question is how or what the people outside of Madagascar can do to help preserve this unique biodiversity in Madagascar? I think, well, uh, the, my, my go-to answer, and, and this is something that I, I truly believe and think is that, well, go visit the St. Louis, especially for people that are, that are living in, in, in St. Louis. Like the St. Louis Zoo is doing a, a, a lot to, um, to help wildlife conservation uh, in Madagascar. And so by supporting the, the zoo, by supporting uh, activities of the zoo, you're supporting um, actions here in, in Madagascar as well. So and that's the, the easy and uh, easy way to, I would say to, to to help conservation here in, in Madagascar, as well as other organizations that are 
that are working for um, wildlife conservation in Madagascar. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Rasam Painarif. I did, I think I pronounced well your last name this time. <laughs> thank you. And I really appreciate, and I want to tell the audience that uh, we are having you since uh, from Madagascar, and it's 1 a.m. right now where you are, and we highly appreciate that you are awake and lucid at this time in Madagascar. And thanks to the audience, uh, for joining us uh, to this fantastic seminar. And we hope uh, you can join us next week. Uh, if you have any final remarks, Fidi, or you want to yeah, just close the seminar? <laughs> yeah, just, uh, just thank you again for inviting me for this seminar. I'm extremely, extremely pleased to be here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks again, and see you all next week in the LC Leonard Collaborative Seminar. Bye.